an Indian astronaut or Gagan Yatri is ready to go to the International Space Station on an Axiom 4 Falcon 9 Crew Dragon. Indian Gagan Yatri is supposed to do seven or eight experiments in space and I have with me Dr. Sharmila Bhattacharya, a biologist by training, works at NASA, has done plenty of experiments at the International Space Station and a very well-known face from NASA. Thanks a lot for speaking to me, Dr. Sharmila. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sharmila, what are the seven or eight experiments which uh, the Indian PIs are doing at the International Space Station and some of them actually you have trained them? Yes, yeah, so I have to say it's my pleasure to um, see these experiments going into space because we will get, we should get very valuable data from them. So as you were saying, Pallava, one of them, for example, called Sprouts, is an experiment that uses the, the two very Indian, uh, the, uh, very important uh, Indian relevant uh, plants. One is methi uh, or fenugreek, and one is the green gram or moong dal. And so Dr. Ravi Kumar Hosamani is the principal investigator uh, who is leading that experiment on this Axiom 4 mission. And the reason this is particularly close to my heart is that Ravi Kumar Hosamani was a postdoctoral fellow who trained in my lab between 2011 and 2017. And together we actually flew three or four missions for NASA on the International Space Station. So he has a lot of experience working with me on those missions. And uh, now he is leading this experiment for uh, ISRO and working in partnership with NASA and Axiom. And the reason this experiment interests me is because he's using two of these, so uh, Methi and Mungal, which are going to be important because moon, for example, is very rich. It's nutritionally very dense. Mm. And so if you can add that to salads or other as a dietary supplement, it, it would be very helpful and useful. And then methi, on the other hand, has a lot of health benefits. So for example, methi can help with uh, uh, bone density, uh, you know, can, can help prevent bone density loss to some extent, or at, le at least has been thought to be uh, useful. It's an Indian spice, which we use very exactly. often, we are very familiar in our kitchen. Exactly, exactly. And then also cardiovascular function, immune function, and all of these, you know, cardiovascular, immune function, uh, bone density, uh, maintenance, these are all important for space flight. So with this experiment, what they're going to be looking at is they're going to sprout these seeds in space, bring them down, and then characterize how they responded in space. And really, the more we characterize and understand these, and these have not been flown before. So, so that's one experiment that I'm excited and, about. And, and let me add, I don't think our astronaut will get to eat any of these because these are going in sealed containers exactly. and they will come back. Exactly, exactly. And in the past, when I've worked with experiments that have had edible uh, products, you know, you do have to go through an approval process. And mostly right now we're doing it for the science. So, uh, but later, you know, as it goes well, and, and this experiment is going to characterize whether there are any microbial growth on the seeds and so on. So it will give us a better idea of that they can be eaten in future, for example. What are the other experiments? So some of the other experiments. So a second one that I also have a personal connection with uh, is uh, uh, from uh, Srija Lakshmi Kumaran from the IIST. Which is the Indian Institute of Space Technology Space in, Science in and Technology. Thiruvananthapuram. Exactly, in Kerala. So Srija and I uh, connected in 2019 when she invited me to the IIST to give a presentation. We met, we had some wonderful conversations talking about flying biology payloads into space. And so um, Srija is doing another experiment on the same mission called uh, Space Crops, uh, actually, Crop Seeds. Sorry. Crop Seeds. Yes, yes, Crop Seeds on ISS. Um, and so that is another experiment that will uh, further look at other crop seeds and uh, expose them to the space environment, then bring them back to Earth and then characterize how they grow, how they germinate. Uh, and some, this is something which 
the Americans have done it earlier. The yes. Chinese have actually done it so many, many times. Yes, as has uh, the, the US, yes, as has NASA, as has ESA. Uh, but again, this is the thing with science is uh, the more you do it, and the more data you get, the better it is for everybody. Uh, also, some of these seeds, uh, for example, are probably seeds that have not been flown before, and they are have some spe specific relevance in the Indian context with the Indian diet. We know many of them have health benefits, nutritional benefits. So again, the more we know about different seeds and different plants that we can use in future in space, the better off we are. And what about the other three or four which are left? Wow. Yes, so so some of the other ones, for example, uh, one of them is using cyanobacteria, which is a um, aquatic bacteria that can photosynthesize. So as you may know, uh, you know, plants can photosynthesize, they can produce oxygen, and they can sequester carbon dioxide. So cyanobacteria has some of these same qualities, even though it's bacteria, but it has many of these functions like plants. And so we have something called ECLIS, which is sort of the environmental control um, system, because when you're inside a habitat, uh, you want to have the oxygen levels, the CO2 levels, the temperature, the humidity be comfortable, just like you, you know in this room sure. here. We want it to be similar. And so you can use uh, organisms, biological systems like cyanobacteria to, for example, produce oxygen in the future and sequester carbon dioxide. Also, it could be edible. It could be, yes. So, well, another set of experiments uh, that uh, is going up on the same mission with the microalgae uh, microalgae are systems that can be used for for food type of supplement, but also for making fuel and have a variety of benefits. So many of these organisms are very useful in the context of space. Um, and the more we study them and characterize them in different missions and use different types of species and different kinds of organisms, the more we can learn about which ones are going to be the best ones for us to use in the future. Sure. And there's also some experiment on muscle cells. That's right, myogenesis, and that one is looking at muscle degradation in flight and what sorts of countermeasure, you know, the more, the better we understand how something is happening in space, the better you can figure out how to counteract any discomfort in the body. You know, what medicines do you need to take? What food can you eat to overcome something? What exercise can you do to reduce muscle loss? So. Yeah, but this is on cells. Yes. We've had actual humans going there. We had Sunita Williams who spent over 10 months in space. Yes, yes. And, and we have a living example in her. Exactly. How much, how much does an in vitro experiment compared to a human being actually on the space station who has subjected herself to an experimentation? How does that differ? Yes. Very good question. So it's this what, uh, what you're referring to is the difference between in vitro and in vivo. In vivo. Yes. Uh, there, are de there can definitely be differences, but in vitro studies in a petri plate can really allow you to do a lot of detailed characterization. And so, for example, you would not, you know, with Sunny Williams, for example, you would not take a muscle sample from her. She would not like that. Um, and nor would any of the astronauts, but when but they you really it, give blood all the time, they do. They give blood they, samples, they, they urine samples, happy, yeah. and so yes. Yeah. In fact, they're they're very very good uh, science subjects. Uh, you know, medical subjects. Well, some of the astronauts told me that we are very good guinea pigs in space. Exactly. Well, we don't want to use that phrase, but True. that's what they told me. True. So, and let me tell you about Sunny Williams. So I have a special connection with Sunny Williams. Oh, she's very special for us also. Exactly. She is a very special yes. person all over, you know, I, I think. Uh, but in 2004, I actually, before she, you know, did all these missions and, and had all these accolades under her belt, I taught her in a, so, so I had a class of students who were astronauts uh, and I was training them about science, you know, how science is done, the technologies we use and why science is important for us to do. So she was in my class of four astronauts wow. and we were staying at Woods Hole, Massachusetts for a month together, all of us. So we got to know each other well. And of course, I've stayed in touch with Sunny over the years. So 
Um, she's a friend and an amazing human being. And so. she's the only samosa eating astronaut <laughs> of the world. That's but, the beauty about her. Yes. We, we, we've had interactions and we've, every time we've had a lovely interaction yes, with her. What about the other person. experiments? Yes. So then, so we talked about the microalgae, we talked about cyanobacteria, we talked about myogenesis. There's something to do with eyes and the screen. Yes. Yes. So that's an interesting experiment also uh, because one of the things that we we've found over the years with with astronauts and people flying in space is that there are often these visual motor spatio-temporal changes because think about it you know you're in space you're on the ground right you live your life on earth where there's gravity and that's what your brain is trained for and now suddenly you go to an environment where you don't have gravity you're in effectively feeling weightless um, and the orientation you know of your body can be anything really you can be standing on your head and doing your experiments you know um, and so you can imagine that your ear, which is, you know, is, is very sensitive to the position of your head and the position of your body, uh, on Earth, we use all of those functions to orient us and to help us do our work. So when you lose some of the sensations in space, it can be uh, physiologically confusing for the body. So this particular experiment is going to use these computer display screens, etc., to kind of monitor some of those changes that the body and the visual system, the brain is undergoing. So that'll be interesting as well. But again, for 25 years, we've had continuous human presence on the International Space Station. Yes. And I presume they have used computer screens all through. They have. Whether they go up or down, they have used computer screens. So what's they new? They have, yes. No, that's a good question. That's again, I think, where science comes in, that some of these, the algorithms and the, the, the specific procedures that are being looked at, again, the more data we have, the better we are. So you're right, there have been a lot of studies with human behavior type studies. In fact, at NASA, there's an entire group that studies uh, the, the responses of astronauts. Uh, but again, the more, you know, we are becoming increasingly dependent on screens um, and looking at computers. And so even if there are some subtle and slight changes, because we, you're right, we know that astronauts perform in space very well, right? They're extremely capable bunch. Sure. They do everything that they need to do. Sometimes and more. better than, better than and us who are on better, our... Exactly. They, they are so fit and so focused. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, I have a good story on that one. One of the early... So I've flown at least nine experiments of my own on the International Space Station. And one of the first ones I flew, the astronaut, uh, it was Thomas Reitzel, I think. Uh, actually, I'm not sure I got the name right. Doesn't but, matter. Yeah. One uh, of the famous Yeah, astronauts. one of... Yes, I think he was the German astronaut. He did my experiment perfectly in space. Now, usually after the experiment in space, you do a ground control that is exactly matched to your samples in space, right? And so we did it in Kennedy Space Center, you know, as, a, as an exact control match. Well, that ground control didn't actually progress as smoothly <laughs> as the one in space. So we had to actually redo it on the ground because some of the temperature conditions and things weren't held and you know some of the procedures didn't happen in this in the correct sequence so you know it just goes to show really some of those crew members are an exceptional in fact all of them i would say are exceptional and and it's so helpful as a scientist when you have a partner you know like an astronaut or a Gaganya 3 or a cosmonaut and they're all so capable to help us do our experiments in space so do you think all of this will feed in well with as India prepares to have its own Indian space station and then finally as Prime Minister Modi says send an Indian to the moon by 2040. So these baby steps which I call in biology will they feed into a longer? Yes absolutely because that is exactly so so i joined nasa back in 1999 and i have been you know doing science all these years and that's exactly what i've been witnessing is 
you know, it is baby steps because it's not easy to do an experiment in space. It's not easy to get time to do experiment in space, right? You need to write grants, you need to get approvals, you know, you've got to make sure your procedures are safe for astronauts, you know, plus you have to have minimal mass, minimal volume, minimal use of, you know, power and so on. So it's not easy to make an experiment successful, um, you know, and craft it in a way that you get the most science out of it. So you need to use the years that exactly like you said, leading up to the 2040s to really gather that data. And I think what's really nice about this uh, series of missions is it's a partnership. It's a partnership with NASA. It's a partnership with Axiom 4. And so ISRO, which is really doing so well in the, the space area, is partnering with others. And that way, you know, at the end of the day, you um, you do more science when you do it as a collective group, right? And so you learn from each other, you know, somebody else in one of the other, you know, either NASA funded or ESA funded or somebody else has done a similar experiment. The, the scientists talk, they learn from each other. Um, and everything ISRO is doing, I think, will really help build that body of data that will help in the future for all nations. So are you excited about these? experiments which India is doing at the International Space Station. Absolutely. You know, for me, I'm excited about any nation doing experiments uh, in space because I think, like I said, we're a collective, we're an international family, right? All of us as scientists, the more we learn, the more we work together, the better it is for everybody. So yes, I definitely am. Thanks a lot for speaking to me, Dr. Sharmila. Absolutely. You have been explaining what has been very complex for our audience. So that was Dr. Sharmila Bhattacharya telling us about the experiments which the Indian Space Research Organization is flying and going to be doing as part of the 14-day Axiom 4 mission, which I sometimes call the mission Akash Ganga. And our astronaut would probably do well on that experiments and the mission. In New Delhi, Palav Bagla for NDTV.